Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand. In part one, we put forth the idea that Aegon Targaryen, under the guise of young Griff, is actually the baby who was born at the Tower of Joy. Coming up in this video, we're going to further explain how it is impossible for him to be the son of Elia and Rhaegar, and tell you everything we know about young Griff slash Aegon. From his appearance to his personality, we will be identifying similarities to Rhaegar and drawing parallels between this Aegon and the egg from the Duncan Egg stories. As Tyrion approaches the shy maid, he sees a boy with blue hair holding a wide-brimmed straw hat, who we find out is young Griff, or Aegon. It took me a few reads to notice this, but there are only two characters in all of George R. R. Martin's books, which take place in the world of Ice and Fire, who have or wear a wide-brimmed straw hat. Obviously, young Griff or Aegon is one, and the other is Aegon the Fifth Targaryen, better known as Egg, from the Duncan Egg stories. Aegon or Egg, brother to Aemon, was born the fourth son of a fourth son to Lady Diana Dane of Starfall and Makar Targaryen. The Duncan Egg trilogy chronicles some of the early years of Aegon V Targaryen's life as he travels with a hedge knight he meets while traveling to a tourney at Ashford named Sir Duncan the Tall, who goes by Dunk. So while Egg had a Dunk, this Aegon has a duck who has a similar backstory and persona as Dunk. Anyways, upon meeting young Griff, one of the very first things Tyrion does is take careful note of his appearance. He was a lithe and well-made youth, with a lanky build and a shock of dark blue hair. The dwarf put his age at fifteen, sixteen, or near enough to make no matter. He then observed that the lad was shorter than Duck, but his lanky build suggested he had not yet come into his full growth. A dance with dragons takes place in the year 300 AC. Tyrion thinks that Aegon appears to be about 15 or 16. Given the description of young Griff slash Aegon and the number of times it is alluded to that he is still growing, I think it's safe to assume that Tyrion's assessment is accurate. So. If young Griff slash Aegon is about 15 or 16 in the year 300, this would mean that he was born in the year 284, which perfectly lines up with the timeline we believe to be true. Our timeline is further supported by a statement made by John Connington in a point of view chapter which occurs later on in No Dance with Dragons, where he thinks 17 years had come and gone since the Battle of the Bells, yet the sound of bells ringing still tied a knot in his guts. The Battle of the Bells took place right around the time that the Siege of Storm's End began, which is known to have lasted a year. This means both the war and the siege ended in the year 284. Afterwards, Ned went in search for his sister. This means that a child born to Lyanna at the Tower of Joy in 284 would be 15 or 16 years old in the year 300 AC. The Aegon born to Elia on Dragonstone in 281 would be 18 turning 19 in the year 300. Now, there is a very large physical difference between a 15-year-old and an 18-year-old boy, so it is unlikely that Tyrion would have misjudged the situation. Tyrion then tells young Griff slash Aegon that in Westeros his blue hair will get him nothing but rocks thrown at him by the boys and laughs from the maidens. Young Griff explains that he dyes his hair in honor of his Tiroshi mother, which, as we mentioned in a previous video, is worth noting because the only woman in the story ever associated with the color blue is Lyanna. But anyway, Tyrion's kind of rude to Young Griff at first, similar to the way he acted when he first met Jon, but he then thinks to himself, This beardless boy could have any maiden in the Seven Kingdoms, blue hair or no. Those eyes would melt them. Like his sire, young Griff had blue eyes, but where his father's eyes were pale, the sons were dark. By lamplight they turned black, and by the light of dusk they seemed purple. His eyelashes were as long as any woman's. Another Westerosi stud, known for being really, really ridiculously good-looking, was Rhaegar. 
so good-looking that even self-absorbed Cersei Lannister disentangled herself from her derangement for long enough to recall how beautiful she had thought Rhaegar was. In A Feast for Crows, Cersei V, she thinks, Many a night she had watched Prince Rhaegar in the hall, playing his silver-stringed harp with those long, elegant fingers of his. Had any man ever been so beautiful? And then she thinks, next to Rhaegar, even her beautiful Jamie had seemed no more than a callow boy. So, young Griff slash Aegon is the right age to be the baby born at the Tower of Joy, and has his father's good looks. He's also described as, or observed to be, a good kid, a fast learner, and skilled at arms. When Illyrio first tells Tyrion about young Griff, he states there never was a nobler lad. Tyrion sits in on lessons with young Griff and notes that while he seems to prefer training at arms, he's clearly quite bright. Young Griff spoke the common tongue as if he had been born to it, and was fluent in High Valyrian, the low dialects of Pentos, Tyro, Shmir, and Lys, and the trade talk of sailors. Following the lesson, Tyrion made the following remark to Half Maester Halden. The boy is bright. You've done well by him. Half the lords in Westeros are not so learned, sad to say. Languages, history, songs, and sums. A heady stew for some sellsword, son. Despite being a quick study, young Griff enjoys his lessons with Duck the most, and as depicted here, is quite good with a sword. Young Griff landed more blows, though ducks were harder. After a while, the bigger man began to tire. His cuts came a little slower, a little lower. Young Griff turned them all and launched a furious attack that forced Sir Raleigh back. When they reached the stern, the lad tied up their blades and slammed a shoulder into duck, and the big man went into the river. So, just like Rhaegar, Aegon is good at everything he does. One distinction between the two is that while Rhaegar preferred books to swords, Aegon prefers swords to books. In part three, we are going to discuss how Aegon is not lacking for courage when faced with danger, and how he proved himself a natural leader when he made the 10,000 men of the Golden Company truly his own.